Father which art in heaven. Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for opportunities that you continually put in front of us. Father, as we come to you with things that we struggle with, let us be honest before you. And those things that are roadblocks from us to us, from reflecting your character, bring them to our memory so that we can deal with them and be closer to you. These things we ask in Yeshua's name. Amen. Please say standing. We're going to say the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to this republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. You may be seated. City Manager, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? There are none, Madam Mayor. Okay, we're going to get started with an exciting swearing in of our new police officers, Chief Barnhill. Thank you, Mayor, Commission, City Manager. Uh, it's always uh, a great opportunity when we are able to come to you and uh, bring in some new employees to the department. So at this point, I would ask my guys, the five guys, uh, nicely dressed to come up to the front, and Judge Kitchen will join them also. I'm going to read a quick bio. Uh, Judge Kitchen is going to swear them in, and then I would like for them to... Uh, meet you all if you don't mind. I'm going to do this in alphabetical order. Um, see if I can, if you guys will just raise your hand so I don't have to point out who's, who's here. The first is Kenneth B. Cleary. He is a West Paducah uh, native. He is a graduate of Heath High School, uh, has college and associate's degree from West Kentucky Community and Technical College. Uh, from 2011 to 2014, he was a military police officer in the United States Army and is currently serving in the United States Army Reserves to include a 13-month extent or, or stint in uh, Afghanistan. Mr. Cleary is single and has no children. The second is Luke Fraley, uh, Smithland native, uh, attended Livingston County High School, also uh, attended West Kentucky Community and Technical College in Murray State University with several credit hours. Uh, he is, uh, has some military experience from 2016 to present. He is a member of the United States Navy Reserves, receiving an Academic Achievement Award in his Master of Arms School. Mr. Fraley uh, is single uh, with no kids. The third is Joseph D. Guy, uh, a Paducah native also. He uh, grew up, I think, in Ballard County, went to Ballard County High School, uh, has some college experience with Paducah Community College and Murray State University. Uh, Mr. Guy has some law enforcement experience, the one, one gentleman out of the five here that has previous sworn experience with the Ballard County Sheriff's Department. Mr. Guy is married uh, with his wife, Jana, and have two children. I think I, I saw her here, but I'm not sure if the kids are here or not. Okay. <laughs> Maybe a wise choice sometimes. I understand that. Uh, the fourth is William Hendrickson, uh, a Paducah native, went to Reedland High School uh, from 2005 and up to present. He is a member of the United States Army and United States Army National Guard as a military police officer. Uh, he is married uh, and has with his with a wife uh, named Bethany and has two children. Uh, I will note uh, Mr. Hendricks, Hendrickson's uh, military experience. Um, he has been deployed to Iraq and has received a Bronze Star and a Purple Heart. So um, we certainly appreciate that. Something to be very proud of. The last and finally, uh, not least, uh, is Alex Liebenrud, uh, is an Illinois native from the Carterville area and has uh, college uh, education from Shawnee Community College and also some, some from Murray State University. Mr. Liebenrud is single with no children. Judge? Hey, Chief, yeah. I, I think Mr. Cleary has has family here. He has a child here. I, 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 I skipped that part here. and I'm, <laughs> I, I'm in trouble, yes. <laughs> And I think I'll probably hear about it from your mother, for sure. So. Gentlemen, would you face me and raise your right hands, please? Do each of you solemnly swear or affirm that you will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of this Commonwealth and be faithful and true to the Commonwealth of Kentucky so long as you continue as citizen thereof? and that you will endeavor to the best of your ability to detect and prosecute all gamblers and others violating the laws against gaming, and that you will faithfully execute to the best of your ability the office of police officer for the Paducah Police Department according to the law, and that you will faithfully discharge the duties of your office, 
and that you do further solemnly swear or affirm that since the adoption of the present Constitution, you, being a citizen of the state, have not fought a duel with deadly weapons within the state nor out of it, nor have you sent or accepted a challenge to fight a duel, duel with deadly weapons, nor have you acted as a second in carrying a challenge, nor aided or assisted any person thus offending, so help you God. Congratulations, gentlemen. Joe, if you'll just lead the way and start down there with Commissioner Wilson and make your rounds. Mayor, if I may add, uh, the numbers in this group were down a little bit, uh, total numbers that have applied, but I can tell you the quality is probably amongst the best that we've had in quite some time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Congratulations. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. I understand. Mayor, the only thing I was adding there is that the, the total numbers in the application pool this time were down, uh, but I think, it, as you can see, the quality of applicants in this uh, pool is probably as good as it has been, and you can certainly see that the group in the back is ready to put them to work, and they're very proud of them also. That's great. Thank you all. Thank you all so Thank much, you. and congratulations again. Okay, we have a proclamation to read tonight. Um, we all know that the solar eclipse is coming our way. It's pretty exciting stuff. I think we sort of know what to expect, but not all the way. So it's going to be an exciting day um, for us on August 21st. So I'm going to read this proclamation tonight. Uh, the West Kentucky Community and Technical College has asked us to do this. Do you want to speak before I read it or after? What would you? Okay. How about I read it first? Okay. All right. So. Whereas the city of Paducah knows that on August 21st, 2017, Paducah is one of the best viewing spots in the entire world for the 2017 total eclipse, total solar eclipse. And whereas this event marks the first total solar eclipse visible in the continental United States in 38 years, and whereas the partial eclipse begins in Paducah at 11.5403 a.m., with totality beginning at 1.2215 p.m., the length of totality is 2 minutes 21 seconds, and whereas many Paducah locations are hosting solar eclipse viewing events for citizens and visitors to enjoy, and whereas West Kentucky Community and Technical College, an official NASA viewing site, is hosting a free night at noon eclipse party on the lawn of the Challenger Learning Center for an opportunity to view the eclipse. And whereas Kentucky native and former astronaut Terry Wilcott will speak at the night at noon event, and guests will also see the NASA high altitude balloon launch. Now, therefore, the city of Paducah does hereby proclaim Monday, August 21st, 2017, as total eclipse of the heart. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I really have always wanted to say that. Um, total, <laughs> total solar eclipse day and encourages the community to practice safety in viewing the eclipse and to enjoy the night at noon event at WKCTC or other eclipse events throughout the city. Uh, we are excited, as everybody is in Western Kentucky. Uh, they are predicting, I'm not sure, anywhere from 100,000 to 500,000 people in Western Kentucky, so that's a big number. Um, we are excited. We'll have lots of vendors and food and music and it'll be a party atmosphere at West Kentucky. They mentioned uh, Terry Wilcutt being our MC, But we're also going to have lots and lots of free viewing glasses. But we wanted to also talk about that we're going to have commemorative T-shirts, night at noon T-shirts, and posters because we want them to be able to remember this day even after August 21st. And we are giving away an Xbox One and game. And we are hoping that you have to be present to win, but we're hoping that you'll go ahead and sign up now because, as you know, when you have lots of people on campus, it's hard to get online at that point. So just to register now, and we invite everybody to come and join us at night at noon. Excellent. Thank you, Thank you very much. And I just want to mention, too, I think the Paducah.Travel website has mm -hmm. a lot of different events also. If you yes. can't make it to your event yes. um, or it's crowded, <laughs> which I'm yes. sure it will be, that there are several other events going on yes. in the city as well. So check those out. At the library, out. and I know that lots of glasses are being given away at the Convention and Visitors Bureau as well. So you have every opportunity to get the glasses to be able to view it safely. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, next up, we have a full agenda tonight. Um, next up, we have a presentation by Dr. Sean Jones and the Purchase Area Health District. Uh, you guys want to come on up? Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you. you. <laughs> the agency that is presenting is actually the McCracken County Agency for Sub -abuse, uh, Substance Abuse Policy. The, uh, and we appreciate the opportunity to talk to you tonight about a proposed amendment to the smoking ordinance in the city of Paducah. And it really just tightens up the existing law to protect all workers, uh, particularly when indoors, and expands uh, some outdoor protections. Secondhand smoke, which is also known as environmental tobacco smoke, is a mixture of smoke that's given off for the burning the end of the tobacco products and the mainstream smoke that's exhaled by smokers. People are exposed to this smoke in a variety of places, but the workplace and other public places such as bars, res restaurants, and recreation venues uh, is our primary consideration tonight. It's harmful and hazardous to the public and is particularly dangerous to children and those who have respiratory ailments uh, as a background in their medical history. There are a number of uh, issues regarding asthma, lower respiratory tract infections, the risk of middle ear infections, cancer-causing agents that are inside stream smoke. And because of the high-level exposure to children, particularly in these instances, and the risk uh, for people with lung and heart disease, there's a large body of evidence that documents uh, exposures produce substantial and immediate effects on the cardiovascular system that even brief exposures can cause, cause significant acute risks, especially to older adults and those who are at risk for cardiovascular disease. And that's something a lot of people don't recognize, that we're not just talking about the development of cancer by intermittent exposure, which is possible, but really within a few minutes of being exposed to secondhand smoke, uh, there are endothelial lung cell changes that occur and changes that occur in a vasculature of a, an innocent individual who inhales that. It is really undeniable that exposure to secondhand smoke is an alarming public health hazard. Approximately 60% of non-smokers in the United States have biologic evidence of secondhand smoke exposure. And it's significantly higher in Kentucky because we have the highest rate of smoking in the country. And there is a very small percentage of our population that is covered by smoke-free laws, less than 30%. In 2006, Richard Carmona, who was a Surgeon General, said that there is no safe or risk-free level of exposure to secondhand smoke. And I wanted to also just refer you for just a moment in your consideration to the Supreme Court opinion that was rendered in 2004. And Justice Wintershimer, with respect to authority, said that protecting the public from exposure to envir environmental tobacco smoke can be the proper object of the police power of local government. The exercise of this power for the purpose of protecting the public health has been termed the law of overruling necessity. The court has held on several occasions that protection of public health is uniformly recognized as a most important municipal function, and it is therefore not only a right but a manifest duty of a city. With respect to private property rights, Justice Wintershimer reported that there is no broader field of police power than that of public health. Both federal and state courts have determined numerous times that where public interest is involved, it is to be preferred over property interest even to the extent of destruction of the property if necessary. Now the proposed amendment uh, to the current ordinance will mandate that all public uh, indoor buildings and buildings open to the public be smoke free. But that ordinance as it exists leaves out workplaces that are not open to the public. And the exemptions that would be removed from the proposed amendment are halls or rooms that are used for private social functions not open to the public, rooms that are used for the treatment of nicotine addiction by licensed health professionals, physically separate and independently ventilated rooms in a hospital, hospice, or nursing home open to all residents as a smoking room, a performer as part of a theater production, indoor smoking areas provided in state or federal government office buildings or workplaces, facilities not open to the public operated by private organizations, and tobacco warehouses. What remains or what is still exempted under the proposed ordinance is retail tobacco outlets. 
uh, which are still exempted under this proposed ordinance. With respect to expanded outdoor protections, city-owned recreational areas, amusement parks, athletic fields, beaches, fairgrounds, gardens, golf courses, parks, outdoor arenas, stadiums, amphitheaters, including bleachers and grandstands, outdoor playgrounds, and outdoor city parks. And these are, uh, the language in the ordinance is standard language that's been adopted by other cities, both in Kentucky and around the country. There are some 26 comprehensive smoke-free ordinances in Kentucky that cover both indoor public places and work spaces questions go ahead uh did you mean it was it a kentucky supreme court decision that you were quoting yes april oh, 22nd 2004 that's when lexington had their initial amendment or proposed ordinance okay. on here it just talks about banning e-cigarettes and electronic smoking devices just um, well, well that's, the, that's the, what the presentation was listed as. A right, that's to ban a, e cigarettes that's, and all electronic smoking devices. That's included electronic cigarettes. But you're actually and going beyond that. Yeah, that's the proposed ordinance. Um, or, or what you're proposing is, is much more than just banning e cigarettes. Well, right? we're not, and this is a technical, we're not banning e cigarettes. What we're saying right. is don't smoke them inside because in 2007 when this ordinance was passed e-cigarettes weren't even really a right. blip on anyone's radar and so there were a number of deficiencies in the law when it was originally passed and not including indoor workplaces is a big one and so instead of just going back and asking you to piecemeal address the deficiencies in the ordinance we included e-cigarettes as well as hookah uh, establishments and and the uh, the ban on indoor work places okay. where you know for example you know a lawyer's office or a doctor's office uh, where people aren't admitted particularly and from the public still needs to be covered if there's you know a um, a, a warehouse that uh, is having people work and the people who work there don't smoke and and yet they allow smoking because the owner smokes or whatever mm -hmm. uh, anyone who has to work in an environment where there's secondhand smoke indoor it would be covered okay I, I guess I just want clarification the ordinance that you are bringing to us for proposal is much more than what our topic said that the presentation the I, was I didn't about. get a copy of the, of the agenda oh, so the title of the presentation. How, how did that topic get on I mean stated the way it is I don't want to talk to Ms. Corno okay I just Mm -hmm. I didn't just say e no, I put ban e-cigarettes and all electronic smoking devices from public places, workplaces, and parks and recreation facilities. That's what we had discussed when we talked on the phone. Which is true. But you're wanting to expand that to more than just electronic smoking devices. Well, right. it wouldn't make much sense to ban them in all those places and allow cigarette smoking. So basically, it's an expansion it's of where yes, it's cigarettes a different expansion, are not allowed. Though. It's an, yeah, 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 yeah. Let me see if I get this right. It's an expansion of the places where cigarettes and electronic cigarettes and all smoking devices are not allowed. Right. Well, it's an expansion it did, of where cigarettes are allowed to be smoked. And then right? adding and then e adding e yeah, okay. What's so it to be covered? It's Maybe. bigger than just the e-cigarettes. It's expanding where smoking is not allowed. Right. right. Which is what he's yes. identifying that more. My point was just that it wouldn't make much sense to have an e-cigarette ordinance that did not allow e-cigarettes but allowed smoking right. and that's what would happen if we did this e-cigarette okay. and without adding the other places i have a question well, so there's no currently any prohibitions on e-cigarettes anywhere you can smoke them wherever you want in the city of paducah S so right. that would be different that would be banning e-cigarettes from the places that we don't allow smoking now right true yes there you go so that's what i'm saying that would be one step and right now, the, what does the ordinance cover? What is what places are you expanding beyond what the ordinance covers? For, for smoking? indoor workplaces Park and parks, right? And all city parks, all city parks, um, outdoor bleachers, stadiums, softball okay. fields, 
any place where the public is that is uh, gathering in an outdoor place. And is yeah. there currently already a retail tobacco establishment exception in place for smoking? Is there current? Well, in in the city of Paducah, there is an exemption for retail outlets. Yes. Already, that yes. already exists, and so yes. we just want to make sure that expands to the e-cigarettes because we're including e-cigarettes in this. That would be technically a retail tobacco outlet. Yes. Okay. This does say 15 feet of bleachers and grandstands. Right, and some places um, use reasonable distance as a. Uh, as an idea, but some of that comes into if you say 15 feet in one place, 25 feet in another, let's say you're downtown on a street and you say 25 feet and you end up in, the, in front of another establishment. So, you know, it, you have to use reasonable in some respects. Uh, that does allow for some interpretation, which gives a lot of people fear. Mm -hmm. uh, but most people, by and large, are law abiding, and if that's the law, they consider it and, and go but in other words if you were outside one restaurant and to get 15 to 25 feet away you had to be in front of another restaurant the whole purpose even as Justice Wintersheimer said in her um, uh, opinion which argued about reasonableness was that the import was to prevent smoke from entering the restaurant and being right in front of the establishment and drafting in you mentioned other Kentucky cities that have gone on with a stricter no smoking policy. Do you know what kind of enforcement issues they may have had? I mean, who are, are the police department? Would they be expected to enforce that? Well, usually it's it's the uh, the owner that does it, or you know, in terms of public parks. It, mo again, most of the time, from what I understand, and in, in Lexington, and I think Louisville's ordinance isn't it going at the end of August, Kaylin? August 20th, I think, is when their ordinance goes into effect. So I can't give you a lot of information about that. But again, there isn't a lot of issues about enforcement because most people, if they know that's the law, follow it. Um, if somebody doesn't, the penalties are relatively minor. It's like a $25 fine. And um, so it's not to be punitive. It's not about the smoker. It's about the smoke. Mm -hmm. What is the thinking, Dr. Jones, behind banning um, smoking in the tobacco stores that are not retail? I can't remember the terminology that you use. Tobacco warehouses. To where, yeah. Which does that mean that you, it's like a hangout place where you go and smoke and then you hang out in that no, it's facility? Where it's manufactured, right? Well, it's where it's stored. Or, stored, okay. Yeah. okay. And I don't even know that we have a tobacco warehouse. This is model language okay. that's, that's given, so, yeah. Right, right where Books a Million is. Oh, yeah, Books okay. a Million used to be a tobacco barn, but it's not. Oh. Well, it, what, not the building, but right. the place. Uh, <laughs> but but they used store, to be a business. But a store that's retail and sells tobacco can't allow smoking in there. It's exempted. Right. Under this ordinance. So, yes. Yeah. This is a suggested one. Did you take this from, Was you said Louisville takes effect. Is um, there anyone it, else that's already passed it? There are 26 okay. comprehensive smoke-free ordinances in Kentucky that cover both public places and workplaces. And um, there are a number of them. Ashland, Bardstown, Berea, Clarksville, Danville, Glasgow, Manchester, Morehead, Prestonburg, Richmond, Versailles, Woodford County, Lexington, and there'll be 14 that have the electronic smoking devices when Louisville's goes into effect 820. Is Louisville's just banning electronic devices or is No, it they've had a comprehensive law previously. Okay. They're just adding electronic cigarettes uh, devices. Any other questions? Anyone? Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you very you much. Thank you so much for being here. All right. Let's move into our business tonight. So we have um, adjusted our agenda to do what's called a consent agenda. And items on this agenda are considered to be routine by the Board of Commissioners. Resolution. I have a resolution. Sorry. First, I have a resolution. Let me do that first. I'm still getting used to the consent agenda. Where is it? Oh, it's attached. Here we go. Well, that's easy. It's simple. 
Okay, so there is a conversation going on um, across our state about the pension system. And um, tonight I am going to move that a resolution entitled, a resolution in support of the separation of the county employees retirement system from the Kentucky retirement systems be adopted. Need a second? Second. May I Any in? comment? Yeah. Please, yes. Um, this is being done at the urging of uh, Kentucky League of Cities, and I was in a meeting with a number of my counterparts last Friday, and uh, most of them had, had acted on this and, and passed it. The idea is to uh, cause a separation between two pieces of the state pension that we're in, one being the county employees retirement system, which cities participate in as well, uh, and the what's called the Kentucky employees retirement system. Um, Part of the reason for this is that our piece of this, while it's not fully funded by any measure, is much less unhealthy than the state piece of it, that being the, the piece that includes state workers. So it's kind of a theoretical thing that as uh, efforts are, uh, take place in Frankfurt to try to find a cure or address this, that the one thing we don't want to have happen is um, because we're the healthier half of, of, of our uh, system that any resources be diverted from the state retirement system to the city county so this separation would theoretically uh, work against that um, of course we have concerns about our own piece and I shared information with the Commission some weeks ago uh, regarding some current projections that the uh, Kentucky League of Cities has uh, released regarding potential uh, adjustments to the uh, city required contribution to uh, the, uh, the our retirement system that is our matching share for our employees participation uh, of course we have two different classifications one is non hazardous and, and one is is hazardous and uh, they're very high uh, as as they stand right now but the uh, uh, potential uh, increase that's being talked about is potentially catastrophic to us uh, at, at the highest level of projection right now uh, of increase in the city's required match rate, uh, it could impact our city at the level of $2.6 million per year. Um, that's equivalent to 30-some city positions by way of what might need to be done or considered to counterbalance that. If that increase uh, were uh, half of that, it would still be $1.3 million, which is a, a big uh, chunk of change when it comes time to decide, well, if, if our costs go up of retirement match, where do we find that kind of money? Uh, clearly, it would impact uh, employees. Um, so it's, it's very, very concerning. And again, I think the sense of this resol resolution is that the management of this issue where our piece of the pension system is concerned would perhaps be afforded some protection if it were allowed to be done on its own because it is as I said less unhealthy than the other piece of it long explanation but yeah, hopefully you find that. that useful appreciate that yeah Actually, Senator Carroll did a great presentation at the chamber breakfast last week and showed us the actual numbers. It was somewhere around 60% funded for the county that we're talking about and only like 16 to 18% funded for the KERS. Yeah, if you're so, going to team up with somebody, yeah. you typically look for a little stronger uh, partner in a certain sense. Well, we're partners now, but uh, if there's an opportunity to have our uh, piece of it addressed on its own merit, again, theoretically, we'd probably be better off. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Any other questions or discussion? Okay, City Clerk. Commissioner Abraham? Aye. Commissioner Holland? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Hartless? Aye. <coughs> okay, now on to the consent agenda. Um, as I said, items on this agenda are considered to be routine by the Board of Commissioners and will be enacted by one motion and one vote. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a board member tells me right now that they'd like to take off any of the items on the agenda to discuss in which event the item will be removed from the consent agenda and considered separately. The city clerk will now read the items recommended for approval. Uh, minutes for the July 25th, 2017 city commission meeting. Item two, receiving file documents. Item three, personnel actions. 
Item 4, a municipal order approving an application and all documents necessary for the City of Paducah Planning Department in partnership with the West Kentucky Community and Technical College to apply for the 2017 Our Town Matching Grant in the amount of $50,000 <coughs> funded through the National Endowment for the Arts for design work and concept plans for an art park to be located next to the Paducah School of Art and Design. Um, the next item is a municipal order of the City of Paducah authorizing the Mayor to execute the deed consideration certificate for the City's acceptance of the transfer of real properties located at 623 and 629 Husband Street, 833 South 5th Street, 1119 South 7th Street, and 700 Caldwell Street. And the last item, a municipal order authorizing the Mayor to execute a charitable <coughs> donation agreement with Pat Brockenborough to accept $500,000 for the construction of a splash pad and restroom facility at the Health Park located at 421 North 13th Street. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. City Clerk. Commissioner Abraham. Aye. Commissioner Holland. Aye. Commissioner Wilson. Aye. Mayor Harless. Aye. And since we're getting used to this consent agenda, I just want to make it a, everyone aware that the items that are on this consent agenda are posted on the website on Fridays. Pam, am I accurate on this? Normally on Friday afternoon. Normally on Friday. Okay. You're on vacation. Right, right, right. She can go on vacation every now and then. We can give her that. Um, so Friday, they're typically posted, all the details of our consent agenda, so we actually get to see them as well. So this isn't just happening the day of the meeting. I want to make sure everyone's aware of that. And obviously, they stay on our website um, probably forever, <laughs> or years and years. So um, those, those documents are available. And also, we cannot not say thank you to Mr. Bruce Brockenborough, who came to our meeting tonight. We have to give him a round of applause for his mom. If you're not aware, um, Bruce's mom, Pat, in honor of herself and her husband, Jim, have donated almost the last amount of money that we need to finish the health park over between Fountain Avenue and Frenchtown. So that is a very exciting opportunity for us. We, there's a lot of partners that have come to the table on that, on that park, and so we're so thankful that you guys were generous enough to help us finish. So. And I'm so excited about the splash pad. <laughs> I'm so excited about the restrooms. <laughs> 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 Can't take kids there. <laughs> oh, that's great. Okay, Can't so moving on. Um, Commissioner <laughs> Abraham, it looks like you have an ordinance. I do. I move that the Board of Commissioners adopt an ordinance entitled an ordinance providing for the closing of Fanoy Street between 20, 1250 North 8th Street and 1408 North 8th Street and authorizes the mayor to execute all documents relating to same. This ordinance is summarized as follows. That the city of Paducah hereby authorizes the closing of Flannoy Street between uh, 1250 North 8th and 1408 North 8th and authorizes the mayor to execute all documents necessary to complete the transfer of properties to the property owners in or abutting the public way to be closed. Second. <clears throat> Any discussion? Hmm? City clerk? Commissioner Abraham? Aye. Commissioner Holland? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Harless? Aye. Commissioner Holland? I move that the Board of Commissioners adopt an ordinance entitled An Ordinance Amending Chapter 2, Article 4, Division 15, Main Street Department Board of Directors of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Paducah, Kentucky. This ordinance is summarized as follows. This ordinance amends Chapter 2, Article 4, Division 15, Main Street Department Board of Directors of the Code of Ordinances to increase the site of the existing Paducah Main Street Board of Directors from five members to seven to nine members with the purpose of adding members with additional areas of expertise to advance the goals of Paducah Main Street. Second. Discussion? City Clerk? Commissioner Abraham? Aye. Commissioner Holland? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Harless? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? I move that the Board of Commissioners introduce an ordinance entitled An Ordinance Amending Chapter 70, Parks and Recreation of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Paducah, Kentucky. This ordinance is summarized as follows. This ordinance amends Section 70-32, Public Parks, Playgrounds, and Recreational Areas Available to the Public to rename the Health Park to the Pat and Jim Brockenborough Rotary Health Park. Hello. Hello, Mayor. Oh, Mayor. second. Hold on. We need oh, a second. Me. I second. second. Okay, you second. <laughs> Mayor, commissioners, this is our part of fulfilling the agreement that you all just made, and uh, we are ecstatic about naming the park for uh, Pat and Jim Brockenborough. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right, next step. City manager, do you have a report? Uh, I've asked Ted McManus, 911 director, to come forward and share some information uh, regarding the uh, phase one project implementation. As you recall, that was approved in the, the budget this year. Hey, did you make copies of, of that? Oh, I'm sorry, I did not. Okay, I, I, I did, so I won't handle that. <laughs> Okay, Mayor, Commissioner, City Manager, um, if you can hear me. Uh, I'll be brief, but obviously we've put forth a lot of effort and finances here, so I'm gonna catch you up to where we are today. Uh, our, our biggest piece that we're working on currently is the CAD, and we, our FP for that is set to be released to the public August 21st. And there's a chart there in the middle of where you have, you can jump down to the bottom and we anticipate final selection around January 15th, and hopefully we'll start this project around March 5th. Um, so that's where we are with the CAD. Um, now the telephone section, we got the 911, we received the 911 services board grant. Uh, we will receive that officially in Frankfurt on August 25th. Uh, we cannot purchase any equipment though until that agreement has been signed by all parties and approved by the finance cabinet. So that is in the works. Uh, so that piece is moving along. And then the other piece is a logging recorder. It's much easier to just view recorder, leave off the word logging. What that does is that records all phone calls and all radio traffic. So if we're doing phone calls, uh, it has to be part of an RFP. Well, we did not do an RFP for the telephone system because it was part of this 911 services grant. So then it would become part of an RFP for the radio system because it works with both, but it has to be purchase and incorporate it with one or the other, your telephone RFP or radio RFP. Well, we're not doing the radio until phase two, so it's abandoned. So we're doing a separate RFP that will run in tandem with our CAD RFP, uh, which we will catch up and sync with the telephone. Uh, so it all should run together. It's very technical, it's very intricate, which is why we've employed federal engineering. They're the experts. And we'll be working very close with AT&T, of course, and uh, Airbus is the vendor. And that's, that's it without probably getting more technical than I know because it's going to get really, really intricate in the coming months. And, and uh, glad to have the people that we've employed to help us do this on board because it is totally a different language. Mm -hmm. I'm learning to speak it, though. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? Sorry, it's your part. You're, you're doing your report, Jeff. No. <laughs> I, I did. Let me interrupt. I'm sorry. I part to ask for questions. I got busy talking from memory rather than looking at my notes. Under the login recorder, we did apply for a Delta Regional grant for $250,000, and the login recorder is $252,000. So very similar in price. Um, that's all on hold. I don't know. Some of you may or may not know, but the, uh, the director of that program is in the process of being replaced. So we do not know the outcome of whether we... Uh, we'll be awarded that grant or not at this time. So we're still moving forward. We just don't know which side of the financing fence we're going to fall on. He's actually a federal co-chairman, so he's appointed by the president with confirmation from Congress. From Congress, so, correct. Yeah. I read that yeah. Yeah. So it's a little bit more. It's take a little bit what you're telling us. It'll take us a little while what you're telling I, us. I don't, I don't know. I hope not. <laughs> yeah, us too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that... That uh, is one of the major projects that was uh, approved in the budget that's uh, off and running. Um, and we look forward to the added uh, capabilities for our 911 uh, users once both the CAD system and the telephone are, uh, the new ones are, are up and running. Um, that's all I had other than uh, we have a couple executive session topics for tonight. I would say, I guess, that uh, Paducah Power Board is meeting at uh, this Thursday at 12 o'clock, uh, after which a, uh, a new general manager will be announced. Great. Good news. Uh, any other comments from the commissioners? Anything? No? Okay. Uh, I have two forms up here for public comment. So I would like to call up uh, Stacy Daniels. I don't have one for you. It's mayor. It's called mayor. <laughs> Gary. 
It's not Brandy. <laughs> it is Mayor. I have a new name. Hi, Stacy. Hello. How are you today? Good. All right, I would like to address the smoking ordinance. Um, my name is Stacy Daniels. I was born and raised in Paducah and I conduct all my business and personal affairs here. I was once skeptical of the effects of second ha secondhand exposure to e-cigs and smoke. I have cystic fibrosis. My lungs are not deteriorated due to a bad habits or a bad lifestyle. They are pro the product of a terminal illness that slowly steals away lung capacity. I always welcomed alternatives to smoking. It allowed me to be around my friends and reduced my exposure to it. Over time, my views have changed. I realized after being around groups of people who were vaping or in the area of smokers that my disease would flare up. I would experience increased cough and inflammation. I'd get feverish. It progressed into infections. This resulted in weeks of IV infusions and loss of lung function due to scarring left. With these consequences, you tend to catch on to things quickly. I had to stop socializing, going to karaoke, concerts, family gatherings, strip malls, etc. This was extremely isolating for me. <clears throat> I hit the mark where I needed a transplant about three years ago. I was in the process of evaluation and I had to pass random drug, alcohol, and nicotine screenings. Any positive results would disqualify me. I wasn't concerned about this because none of these were my vices. <clears throat> and I passed many of these over a course of time. I was at the evaluation appointment that marked my halfway point to qualification. I was called for screening, screening and gave my sample. The doctor whacked, walked back in with a look of disdain. I was confused. I knew something wasn't right. He said to me, your nicotine test was positive and you're disqualified. My heart sank and I was in shock and denial because I felt like I had just been handed my death sentence. How could this have happened? My mind whirled into chaos. I said, what? And I argued with him. I swore that they confused my results with somebody else's and that there was no possible way this could happen. I'm not a smoker. I don't dip. I don't use patches. I don't use nicotine. My doctor refused to believe me. I was at a loss. There was nothing I could do. This created a dynamic of distrust between me and my doctor that I'm still trying to repair. He didn't believe that the only thing I had ever been around was secondhand smoke and vape. It was unfair and out of my control, but there was nothing I could do. He said, no, it's impossible. I asked him to test me again, but he said that that's not allowed. <clears throat> I felt robbed and broken. After this, I spiraled into a deep depression that I'm only recently overcoming. It's been three years since that incident, and I'm still working to convince them. My lung function lingers in the 20s, and it's dwindling. I'm dependent on supplemental oxygen, and I'm 29 years old, and secondhand smoke robbed me of a chance at life. I fight with all I have every day to survive until I can convince them to reevaluate me. Was this purely, purely coincidence? I'll let you be the judge of that. All I know is that the course of my life has been profoundly impacted by secondhand exposure. No one had ill intentions, but it cost me the ability to get a life-saving transplant. I can't walk out of a public building where people are smoking without going into a coughing fit. My heart rate skyrockets, and I start seeing stars. People yell at me, smoke another one. Being terminally ill shouldn't be a prison sentence for me. I shouldn't be forced to sit at home and deteriorate. I still have goals and desires like many other 29-year-olds. <clears throat> this is why I think that it's dire that people keep the use of their devices out of our public areas. We don't realize how much of an impact we have on those around us until we become the people who are being impacted. Yeah. That is all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. That's right. Next up, Gary Vanderbilt. I think there were two on that smoking. There was. Yeah, I'm gonna let him go last. First of all, I'd like to say I've never seen a, such a young lady with the prettiest hair color in my life. You get to the older, you get a little older, and you really don't think that you're gonna ever have gray hair. 
but it's really pretty. I've seen several of the young kids with that. It's amazing timing that we have tonight. Uh, and Brandy, I'll pass. I've given Dr. I, I was just going to suggest Jones. that you call her mayor. <laughs> oh, excuse me. I Sandra didn't hear that. Sandra likes me to call, be called mayor. Oh. She, she, she should be called mayor. I should call her that. Yeah, well, especially in a city a commission meeting. meeting. <laughs> especially in a city commission meeting. Sandra. <laughs> Commissioner Wilson. Commissioner Wilson, mm -hmm. right. Are these individuals? Oh, I, think, I think, let me, let me just speak Am I sharing for these with people? I? What am I, is this to pass out? Yeah, that's for you to receive oh, and myself. file tonight. Okay. And so we'll, we'll pull it back out. But the, we'll the issue we have going on here is community health. And what all of you are aware of is, ironically, this young lady back here is, the timing uh, is amazing because we have WPSD here. We want to make sure they're aware of what's been going on in the community. But five years ago, I stepped before this commission and I believe, Richard, maybe you're the only one, Commissioner Abraham, I might add. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. And the frustration for my coworkers at the plant and some of the citizens in Paducah are that we're facing a health issue here in Paducah that not only is it internal or interior smoking of facilities, which is absolutely atrocious, for these young kids to go in a restaurant, I see it all the time. I've got, I've had kids come in and with their parents and they're smoking and in cars smoking. These are all confined areas, but really what, what is going on in the community is their lungs are being destroyed. And what she's talking about, ironically, it's so young, but we've got kids that are 30 years old, 40 years old, 50 years old, and they're going into the Paducah gas diffusion plant, and then the pulmonary function test that they're taking, first they come in, their lungs are fine, and then you hear about the safety of the Paducah plant, but then the safety is not documented, and I'm looking at two employees right here, or two workers at the plant that's got the same problem as this young lady right here. Now, when you go into the plant and you're told, and I've warned all of you, don't go anywhere inside that plant. You don't know what's there. And so I'm a nuclear whistleblower, proud of it. And so what we've exposed is that the Paducah workers and what uh, Mayor Harless, you just received, and I've given you the web links already. On October, uh, excuse me, on July 21st, a, a letter was published, but it was published by a newspaper in, or a website in Washington, D.C. And what you all have heard me say repeatedly, we developed the evidence, it's irrefutable. You can put every attorney in front of me and they know what's coming, and Paducah attorneys. And at one time there was a brave young commissioner right here by the name of Carol Galt. And she came forward and wanted to have a public meeting to sit down and discuss this, 2005. Never happened. <clears throat> we know why it didn't happen. But you all are new. You're the board of the city of Paducah and city commissioner, commissioners and mayor. And what you need to be aware of is there was a nuclear whistleblower that came forward from the Department of Labor on March 26, 2016. That nuclear whistleblower gave me the gave me a letter, here it is, pass it around, you can receive and file this, Commissioner Abraham, and there it is. I redacted the names, I redacted everything because I recognized what he gave me was a death sentence for a whistleblower. <clears throat> the doctors in this community know about this, every one of them. There's not a one that could miss it. So when I see young ladies like this, young kids, you need to be aware of all of the workforce at the Paducah gaseous diffusion plant has been poisoned. And we've now got the backup, we've got DOJ, we've got FBI in it, and I want you all to be on our side and not against us. Because what DOE has done is despicable and according to the young lady, Susan Crabtree, horrible for what they've done to my claimants. My claimants, Commonwealth Environmental Services claimants, which we got no help 
from our Kentucky congressional delegation. But now there's a big movement in front of uh, the senators in Congress and the congressmen. Not ours, uh, not that I'm aware of. Although we do say we're getting support from Jamie Comer because he went to Carlisle County and met with several hundred people. And out of the audience came several nuclear workers and said they're sick and tired of people cheating them out of their compensation, but more importantly, Mayor, their, their medical benefits. Atrocious. If this young lady had ever been a nuclear worker, I'd have her lungs replaced in no time. Because the EUICPA is the, is the product of four of my nuclear co-workers, George Johnson's co-workers. We all knew, we didn't know really what was going on, but it was, a congr it was an investigation under fraud. The very law firms in this Paducah knew all about it. They were tipped off. The documents were released. I got caught up in a congrat I got caught up in a, a, a false claims investigation. Whitlow and Roberts represented me, then turned on me, and the very attorneys that we're all putting out for the world to see are in this community. And all I can say is they should be ashamed because anybody in this community ought to be entitled to health care. And I want to see that young lady get another chance at lungs. My goodness, at least she hadn't got beryllium in her lungs or she wouldn't even be here right now. We, we all are exposed to beryllium. I've been exposed to it. I don't like it. And after, after I left you all in 2012 and gave you the hint, nothing occurred. Mayor Paxton at that time, although I don't think he really understood it, and I want to be as courteous as I can, as diplomatic, because, Mayor, we worked, we worked our tails off to get you in as mayor. Right, Steve? Yes, sir. And so we knew we had to have change. But once we had change, Richard, I mean, Commissioner Abraham, and Alan Rhodes, Commissioner Rhodes, and Commissioner Holland, we knew we had the ear. Oh, sorry. Sandra, I already apologize. I'd probably forget you. Commissioner, Commissioner Wilson. Wilson. Now, we, we all know that there's a lot of competition, competition about federal dollars in this community. But I'm not one of them that's going to worry about whether DOE gives you all grants and everything or whoever. Mr. Thompson, Mr. Murphy, everybody's getting the money. But we want the money coming back to the nuclear workers that are 15,000 of us in this one community alone. And I'm only the chairman of the Nuclear Whistleblower Alliance that serves the nation. And so you can see how impassionate I am, but I'm getting sick and tired of seeing young kids in this community. Nicotine, very well. But I'm going to tell you, the toxic chemicals that were spread over Paducah are already on the record. When you add those, it's called a synergi synergistic, synergistic effect. Dr. Jones knows all about it. The plutonium that was released across our community is there for everybody to understand. Oh, somebody wrote on my Facebook. Oh, my goodness. That's an old story. WPSD sitting there. You should know better. There was a Lauren Adams that interviewed my workers. Half of them are dead now. Their lungs were taken from them. I couldn't even get one of them dying for beryllium disease, or I was really not his authorized representative, because they rushed him to Louisville for a lung transplant, and somebody at the Paducah plant called and canceled his lung transplant. Out, unbelievable. He died in Lourdes Hospital, and I've got all the pictures to show you. Mayor Harless, I come here tonight because here's another example. I predicted this five years ago. Whistleblower knew what I was doing. He came from DOL. Now he's in the headlines. And no, no, it wasn't ANWAG that picked this up. It was your local Commonwealth Environmental Services Vice President, Gary Vanderbilt. No brag, just fact. I'm sick and tired of DOE and DOL blowing smoke up everybody's ass around here. Pardon me. That'll be bleeped, I hope. But we're frustrated. We're dying. I'm getting sick and tired of watching my coworkers, including Bud Jenkins, one of the very four, uh, one of the very four that filed this lawsuit to win this nuclear worker, sick worker program under the false claims that he filed before I ever knew about him. He then died and his wife died. 
And the games that they played, I've got all documents, all the documents, because I was his authorized representative. I'm listed on these sheets as Gary Vanderbilt, Vice President, Commonwealth Environmental Services, DOL authorized representative C-001 for a reason. The DOL didn't want the authorized representatives coming together, but we've gone way above them. We've organized the whistleblowers across the nation now. We're sisters of Portsmouth. The sister plant of, of Paducah is Port, Portsmouth plant. Unbelievable, the stuff that happened at Paducah was already on its way to being covered up at Rocky Flats. I even brought up one of the nights that none of you were, except maybe Commissioner Abraham, were on this board, but it was ambush grand jury, a brave FBI agent, and a, and a brave, you got a question, Commissioner? Nope. Okay. Uh, a brave FBI agent and a grand jury foreman uh, by the name of Wes McKinney, and the FBI agent was Mr. Lipke, my office was taken over, basically, by DOJ, three FBI agents, and as Gary Long said, jokingly, is there anybody in this office from the CIA? Well, I would have guessed there was, but I can tell you for certain, none of these people heard a lie. And unfortunately for me, I just happened to be the design engineer for the C-746U landfill, just like I was for the city of Paducah, by the way. And I designed a landfill that saved DOE nine, uh, $60 million, and that's what I liked. And Rick will appreciate it when he sees the plans. But it saved the country and public and taxpayers $60 million, and then DOE came after me. Don Seaborg was an asset to this community, and he was my DOE protector. If you all don't remember him, look him up. Because he was brave and stood against the very DOE henchman that came in from Rocky Flats with his partner, Barbara Mazeroski. We don't believe, we don't breathe plutonium in this area, but you're gonna see what came in in the toxic cylinders from, from Rocky Flats, well, from Hanford, basically. And so we want this community not to hide and cower against their fears, so therefore I sent out, uh, I'll end this, and you've been a gracious host, I might add, and I've always known Mayor Harless was there for us because you can't be against sick nuclear workers. I'm getting sick and tired of seeing my claimants come in and I'm counting the days when they die and DOL plays games with them. And that's what you're seeing in the headlines and I've already talked, met with, uh, Su I've already talked with Susan Crabtree. Gee whiz, she picked it up in five minutes. Why are we letting that happen? Didn't we just hear that there is ordinances proposed. Well, five years ago, Mayor Paxton said, we, we can't help if anyone lives or dies. Well, I challenge him now to come up here and stand up for these people. Because I want to see that young lady, I've never met her in my life, and I want to see her get lungs that I don't understand, Dr. Jones, how could anybody ever say she couldn't? If we have to donate in this community to get that young lady lungs, why don't we just do it? And then we'll show you 5,000 more that are sitting at that plant on their deathbed. And I don't appreciate coming down with the symptoms of whatever a worker George knows. We worked side by side in the 720 building. We didn't know that DOE was hiding beryllium from us. I didn't know until a U.S. attorney for the Western Condi District, Bill Camel, told me, Gary, be careful. You all didn't know you were breathing beryllium. Richard, I mean, Commissioner Abraham, the board, mayor, do not go in that plant until you find out what tiny speck of beryllium vaporized in the air if you're allergic to it, and if you don't even have to be allergic to it, it's a death sentence. So let's get off our tails and rally together. And there's been some communications recently. We want to go on the record. My, I, I don't look at my, my Paducah police as confrontational. But I will tell you, on Thursday, Chief Brandon uh, Barnhill, we're gonna be at the, the Cold War Patriots meeting. And we've got the U.S. Department of Justice on notice. And if my, if my claimants are threatened with arrest, you're gonna have it on video. Just like they did to me July 26th. 
but we caught him on body cams and his officer did a great job. But I will tell you right now, the Paducah officer that accused me of charging 33% for a fee, that goes back, go back to Bill, Mer Bill Paxton's comments. Where are you all getting your information? Through rumors and innuendos? Not you, Mayor, because you had not been here long enough. But we're gonna get to the bottom of it. City manager knows all about it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for being much. here. Anybody else, George, you want to make a comment? No. Okay. Thanks. Okay, John Montville. I hope I got that right. If I didn't, you can, okay. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, uh, commissioners. Um, here to show my support for the smoking ordinance that was discussed earlier. Uh, my name is John Montville again. I am executive director of oncology at Lourdes Hospital. Um, I've been an oncology administrator for 26 years. You can imagine what I've seen. Um, I lost my own father to lung cancer directly related to smoking, which is what started me in my career. And I was a smoker myself, so I know the joy of quitting. Uh, so you can probably guess how I feel about smoking. But on this particular topic, I think it's important to understand uh, the balance. And I do, I understand freedoms. I understand as long as smoking is allowed in this country, people have the right to smoke and are free to do so. But I would ask this group to please consider the rights of those who do not smoke. Please consider their freedoms. Please consider their uh, opportunity to attend events and to be in the park and to leave the business and those that may be workers at some of, of these excluded areas, uh, think about their rights and their freedoms to be healthy and safe. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate that. Okay, I think that we have a few, Commissioner Abraham, you have a motion I for do. executive session? I move that the Board of Commissioners go into closed session for discussion of matters pertaining to the following topics. Issues which may lead to the appointment, dismissal, or disciplining of an employee as permitted by KRS 61.8101F and also a specific proposal by a business entity where public discussion of the subject matter would jeopardize the location, retention, expansion, or upgrading of a business entity as permitted by KRS 61.8101G. Second. Excuse me. Commissioner Abraham? Aye. Commissioner Holland? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Hartless? Aye. Thank you all for being here. We will come back to adjourn. Um, you, if you want to stay, you can. <laughs> but you probably do not want to do that. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Slide.